Welcome to Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson. I hope everybody is uh, doing well today. Um, I want to apologize uh, from the get-go. Um, I've been going every other week right now with the podcast. I've had a lot of th- projects going on, and they all seem to be coming to fruition. So we should be getting back to a little bit more regular schedule. But I wanted to say that I, I've been taking some of the stories that I've told on my podcast. I mean, this is uh, number 76, and it's been rolling along. So I've taken some of the stories, and I've written them into short stories. Um, I collected about 14 so- short stories, and I'll be publishing those uh, next year. I did one self-published book, uh, The Mosaic Artist, and for people who have uh, been listening uh, from the beginning, you'll, re- you'll recognize the title and remember the story, I hope. Um, the Mosaic Artist is uh, available on Kindle and, and through paperback on Amazon. Um, it was a part of my Dry Port series um, in which I take some stories that I heard in places that used to be uh, famous ports, um, Seville in Spain, um, very famous port, all the gold from the New World that uh, came across by the Spanish ended up going through Sevilla and uh, then on to Madrid. And Sevilla became one of the most powerful and richest cities in the world. Um, It is a beautiful place, and the story uh, I wrote is about a little boy coming of age during the madness of the Spanish Civil War. Um, It's a story that's sort of universal. Um, It's applicable today. Um, I wish you would take a look at it and read it, uh, buy the book. It's on Amazon. I'll be publishing another one uh, in a couple of weeks um, called The Casket Salesman. The Casket Salesman, um, the sailing connection to the Casket Salesman is um, my grandfather, uh, who was an extraordinarily interesting man, um, gave me or left me um, an ice boat. And that's how I ended up getting into uh, ice boat sailing. And um, one of the great thrills of my life was going ice boat sailing. And um, it's, if you've never been ice boat sailing, it's like zero to 60 in a heartbeat. And it's great fun. Cold, but great fun. And uh, if you're a sailor and you've never been ice boating, um, you've got to put that on your bucket list to do that. So this story is about me traveling with my grandfather, who was actually a, a casket salesman uh, for the Miller Casket Company uh, for two weeks, just he and I driving around uh, northeastern Pennsylvania and southern New York, selling caskets to funeral um, uh, funeral directors and, and, and visiting all sorts of neat and wonderful places that you would take a 12-year-old to. Um, a lot of fun, a very funny story. I had originally written it as a movie. Um, the story had been optioned. Um, it's, uh, it fell out of option. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about it becoming a, a, a film and, um, uh, there's some com- conversation about Sam Neill being involved with the project. Um, so we're pretty excited about that, but, uh, I'm, I've, I've got the short story. It's a very long short story. It's almost a novella and, and that's been, um, occupying a lot of my time. But it's a sailing story, and I want to get these out um, because I think they're, they're, I hopefully think they're important. But today's story is about the American pilot, and there's a very interesting um, history to the American pilots. And these are the guys that go out, meet the big container ships and cargo ships and whatever, uh, oil tankers, and they bring them into the harbor. Um, they're in all the major ports in the world. Um, it's a, it's a very, uh, dangerous job. Um, it is, it's, it's a very particular job. Uh, you need at least two and a half years, um, apprenticeship in order to, um, end up taking command of one of those ships. These guys are really good at what they do. 
And they're the ones with the local knowledge, which is the prime thing for a pilot, of, of shoals, sandbars, uh, rocks, where the, you know, where the uh, docks are, you know, everything that you need to do. And they bring ships up um, the river. The Sandy Hook pilots are very famous in New York because they go way out. Um, out to that lighthouse out there, which most people in New York don't know exist, but there's a giant lighthouse out at the uh, mouth of uh, New York Harbor that uh, the big ships are met by the Sandy Hook pilots who bring the ships in uh, and up the Hudson River. So there's a lot of different, there's there's pilots in Clearwater, there's pilots in Miami, there's pilots in every major port in the world, Frankfurt, um, I was thinking Amsterdam as well. But this is an important job. It requires a lot of local knowledge and a lot of training, and it's actually quite a dangerous job. Um, stepping off a moving boat onto a giant ship is is not an easy thing to do. You've got to know what you're doing, and you got to be a little bit brave about doing it. But prior to... Um, you know, all the navigation aids being out, uh, being put out um, by the Coast Guard and, and things of that nature and, and the Navy and all the rest were going back into the 17th and 18th century um, where there were very few navigational aids. Pilots were local fishermen. And in general, not always, but in general, the pilots were black fishermen who were slaves. And these, these guys were the ones who would go out, sail out, no power we're talking about here, just sail out, meet a ship of the line, for example, all right, and pilot that ship up the Charleston River into Charleston or up the Delaware River from Cape May up the Delaware River to Philadelphia. These, these were real, technically brilliant sailors because they had to sail these things. And they had to guide the ships over shoals. There wasn't anybody out there, you know, digging, digging away the sandbars. You know, if there was a storm, you know, the river, the Delaware River, very interestingly, I, I know this, is that it would silt a lot. So it would hold up traffic. But today it's dredged almost on a constant basis by the um, Army Corps of Engineers. And so it's, it's a clear path. It's the same with the inland waterway. And this is the same thing in Charleston. They do the same thing. Any river is going to silt up. And it's a very interesting thing that the pilots, this is what they have to know. And at the time, and the character of this story is Robert Smalls, who is an extraordinary, was an extraordinary human being. Um, he was, uh, an American, he ended up being an American politician. He was a slave. Let's start with that. And he freed his family and his crew by commandeering a Confederate transport ship, the CSS planter in Charleston Harbor on May 13th, 1862 and sailing it from Confederate controlled waters in the harbor to a USA, U.S. blockade that was surrounding him. This is Fort Sumter. Could have blown the boat right out of the water at any time. And he turned it over. He was, he was an example. Now, this is interesting, too, is the way they write about it. He was an example that, that people used to persuade President Abraham Lincoln to accept African-American soldiers into the Union Army. Think about that for just a second. Um... The slave, the black slave, okay, was thought of as not being bright, just they were they were just beasts of burden. And this is what people thought. And I know there's a lot of conversation about critical race theory and all the rest of this kind of stuff, and people getting all their their, their panties in a in a pinch for these. But but these people were were thought of just as cattle, okay? They were used, they were abused, and well documented. And the thing is, is that most of the pilots at this time, 
on a coastline, the American coastline, which is a very dangerous coastline, North Carolina, Cape Hatteras, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, if you can go all the way up to Maine, these are all really quite dangerous, okay? Now, given Maine, Massachusetts, these coasts, um, the water is relatively deep, and so, you know, there's not as many hazards. Um, The rivers are not as big. I mean, they are big when you get up to the St. Lawrence, um, all the way up above Maine. But the important thing here, the point I'm trying to make is, is that it took somebody with a great deal of feel, intelligence, and experience to be a maritime pilot in the 16th and 17th centuries and the 18th century. So our guy, Robert Smalls, commandeered this ship, took it to the Union people, he was an example to Abraham Lincoln as them saying, look, here's this guy's really smart. He's very intelligent. He's very charismatic. Um, this is what he did. He's on our side. And he eventually became, um, uh, he eventually became a, a Republican in the South Carolina legislature. And he was the first uh, black man in the House of Representatives representing um, the uh, 5th Congressional District in South Carolina, which, by the way, the next Republican up was Mike or Mick uh, Mulvaney, who is pretty much a racist and a Trumpist, um, which is quite ironic, and he took over the seat in 2011. And so there's, there's like some very interesting things going along this, and this guy was, um, as we say, you know, one of the forefathers. So... He was born in 1839 to uh, Lydia Poletti, uh, who was an enslaved woman owned by Henry McKee. I mean, just saying that makes me, I get weird about it. Um, She gave birth to uh, Robert uh, behind McKee's house at 511 Prince Street in Buford, North Carolina, or Buford, South Carolina, which I think is kind of neat. Um... They lived there. When he was 12, um, his mother sent, uh, convinced uh, his master to send him um, to Charleston and to be hired out for labor. This is a thing that, that uh, slave owners often did. They would take uh, the, one of their slaves and they would, they would hire them out. And they would, whatever they earned um, would go into the slave owner's pocket. Um, he was a laborer for a dollar a week. And then the rest of the wage would be would be paid to the, to the master. Um, you can go back and 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 and, and look at um, uh, at Douglas. He did the same thing. He was he was hired out to a shipyard, um, and he worked the docks uh, just like Smalls did as a longshoreman. He worked as a rigger and a sailmaker, and eventually he worked his way up to um, what was a wheelman or more or less a helmsman. Um, though at this, ti- at this time, slaves were not permitted to have the title of helmsman. And this is the beginning of, of being a pilot, okay? Because the pilot is the captain of that particular ship. So at 17, Smalls ended up marrying Hannah Jones, who was an enslaved uh, hotel maid. Um, she was five years his senior, and she had already had two daughters, and they had their own first child, and three years later, they had another son, Robert Jr. And, and I want you to think about the timing of this, just in terms of the reality of what's going on. Um, all of this is happening in, say, in 1856. A lot of the Civil War people were, ju- were passing away, just like our World War II veterans today are, are passing away or have passed away another 80, 90 years later. And that puts them very much into the modern times. That's how, how recent this effect and, and the way of life that slavery engendered and what it did to people, how close it is. I mean, I'm thinking of it in terms of my lifetime. I know somewhere when I was a child, I probably met... <laughs> 
a Civil War veteran. That would be in the 1950s. So they would have been like 90. I remember faintly something of that nature. So going back to Robert and his, uh, who, who later died when he was like two years old, the son, and um, he wanted to purchase, uh, Robert Smalls wanted to purchase his family. And, and it, but the price was very steep. It was $800. And um, the equivalent of which is about twenty three thousand dollars today, but he had managed to save up about a hundred bucks, and it would take him easily if if he had waited, it would have taken him um, a decade to reach eight hundred dollars. And so, in eighteen sixty one, when the Civil War began, and the Battle of Fort Sumter in nearby Charleston Harbor, the fall of eighteen sixty one, Smalls was assigned. Uh, to steer the uh, CSS, Confederate Steamship Planter, and it was a lightly armed Confederate military transport under the command of a Charleston uh, District Commander, Brigadier General Roswell S. Ripley. Planter's duties were to survey waterways, to lay mines, and to deliver dispatches, troops, and supplies. And Smalls piloted the planter throughout the Charleston Harbor and beyond on uh, the rivers all along South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coasts. This guy really knew his stuff. And his job was to avoid, to see, to avoid being caught by the Union or the Federal blockade. Um, and he would, uh, he would run back and forth and uh, not get caught with this ship. Now he did have um, uh, he did have other uh, slaves on board, and in fact he had discussed this his plan of escape um, with the entire crew except for one person whom he didn't trust, and the psychology of this is very interesting. So on May twelfth, eighteen sixty two, the planner traveled ten miles southwest of Charleston to stop at Coles Island a Confederate post along the Stono River. And that was being actually dismantled, and the Union didn't know about this. There the ship picked up four large guns to transport to the fort in Charleston Harbor. Back in Charleston, the crew loaded 200 pounds of ammunition, 20 uh, pounds of cord and firewood, 20 pounds of cord firewood. And um, so they were all loaded, uh, plenty of fuel, big-ass guns, and plenty of ammunition. So on the evening of May 12th, the planter was docked at its usual spot on the wharf of gen just below General, General Ripley's uh, headquarters. Its three white officers disembarked to spend the night ashore, leaving Smalls and his crew on board as was their custom. They did this quite often. Talking entitled people here. After the three, conf after he stole the boat, the three Confederate officers were court-martialed and two convicted, but their vic their verdicts were later overturned um, because they just, they didn't believe, the testimony was, is they didn't believe that Robert Smalls and his crew were smart enough because they were black or brave enough, because they were black, to commandeer the ship or steal the ship, they couldn't. They they couldn't fathom that was the case, that 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 this guy was smart enough to do it. So before these officers departed, Smalls asked Captain uh, Ria if the crew's families could visit, um, which was occasionally allowed and approved on condition that they depart before curfew. When the families arrived, the men revealed the plan to them. And this is a quote from what actually happened when they revealed the plan. Uh, this was the first the women and children had heard of it. Although Smalls had recently told his wife Hannah, she had known Smalls long to escape, but hadn't realized that he was formulating a plan and intended to execute it. She was taken aback and quickly regained her composure and told him, 
It is a risk, dear, but you and I and our little ones must be free. I will go where you die. I will die. The other women were less steadfast. They cried and screamed, and when they learned what they had stumbled into, the men struggled to keep them quiet. Later, once the shock had worn off, these women admitted that they were glad for a chance for freedom. Now, I think it's important to step back for a second as a modern uh, person and realize where the psychology of these slaves, where they were as human beings. They were living in a very oppressed situation, which they had adapted to. They had, they had, they had learned. Um, most of them, almost all of them, were uneducated. Robert Smalls at the time couldn't read or write. And they had a very limited knowledge of what was outside their very place of, of living. I think this is lost on a lot of people. Um, they weren't educated to know where Philadelphia was. So that was a thing in their mind that was way out there. They, to walk to Philadelphia was, they, they couldn't fathom that. Um, to cross a river during that time, okay, was a hazard. And there were a lot of rivers between South Carolina and freedom. And these obstacles were just enormous. And they were especially enormous with the fact that they couldn't grasp an overall picture because nobody would take it. And even the white people that populated these plantations at the time had a limited grasp of what the world was like. But you take somebody like Robert Smalls, who is an experienced American pilot who has been up and down the coast from Charleston down to Florida and Georgia and in and out of every inlet that you could possibly do and every, up and down every river that you could possibly do, who could see the Union ships, who understood where the lines of, of freedom were. This was such a revelation to, I would think, to him and to these other people once they, they, they had given their trust to him that he knew what he was doing. And this was extremely rare. Most people, most black people, most slaves, and even white people had no sense of the bigness of the largeness of the earth. So their actions were actions of real of faith and desperation, sort of, and hope, kind of all tied up into a single bundle. So understand the stakes here. If they're caught... They will be killed. Simple as that. So the stakes are high. So at some point, uh, three crew members pretended to escort the family members back home, but circled around and hid on board the steamer. And the steamer's docked at the North Atlantic Wharf. So at 3 a.m. in May 13th, Smalls and seven of the eight slave crew members made their previously planned escape to the Union blockaded ships. Smalls put on a captain's uniform and wore a straw hat similar to the captain's. He sailed the planter past what was then called the Southern Wharf and stopped at another wharf to pick up his wife, his children, and the families of the other crewmen. Smalls guided the ship um, past five Confederate harbor forts without incident as he gave them the correct uh, signals at checkpoints. And the planner had been commanded by Captain Charles C.H. Rila and Smalls copied Rila's manners and straw hat on deck to fool Confederate onlookers from the shore and the forts. And the planter sailed past Fort Sumter at about 4.30 a.m. As the nearly free slaves approached Fort Sumter, their apprehension began to grow. Up, to grow. There's some big-ass guns. If you've ever been there, there's, guns are still there. Big, 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 big. It was heavily armed, and it was intended and manned by very suspicious soldiers. And one man aboard later said that when he drew near the fort, every man but Robert Smalls 
fell to his knees, giving way, and the women began crying and praying. I think that's amazing. So he steered the ship along the normal path, even though his cohorts wanted him to go as far away from the guns as possible. And he said, no, we're going to go right down what we would normally do. We're just going to be normal, do the normal path. And then they were just sailing through the morning, early morning air in no particular hurry, and Fort Sumter flashed a challenge signal. And Smalls, again, gave the correct hand signals. There was a long pause, and the fort didn't immediately respond. And Smalls, now expecting cannon fire to shred the planter at any moment, finally the fort signal came through as well, and Smalls sailed his ship out of the harbor. The alarm was only raised after the ship was beyond the gun range. Rather than turn eastwards towards Morris Island, Smalls headed straight for the Union Navy fleet, replacing the rebel flag with a white bedsheet, which was brought by his wife. The planter had been seen by the USS Onward, which was, until, uh, until just a few minutes, was about ready to fire on it because they thought it was a Confederate ship. They recognized these ships. And in the dark, it was difficult to see. And then when they, a witness account it was that just before the number three port gun was being elevated, someone cried out, I see what looks like a white flag. And true enough, there was something flying from the steamer that would have been white by application of soap and water. Soap and water. And as she neared, um, everybody looked for a white man on board. When they discovered there were none, they rushed and they found that these slaves had uh, commandeered this ship and everybody was dancing and singing and whistling and jumping and everybody thought. And, and others stood towards the Fort Sumter and they were muttering some sorts of maledictions, as they say. And the colored men, as they called them, stepped forward and taking off his hat, he shouted, Robert Small shouted, Good morning, sir. I have brought you some old United States guns, sir. And that was Robert Smalls. The onward captain, John Frederick Nichols, boarded the planter and Smalls and asked um, for a United States flag to be displayed, and he surrendered the planter and its cargo to the United States Navy. And Smalls' escape plan had succeeded. But this is sort of almost only the beginning. The bravery, the information, the, the knowledge that Robert Smalls had um, was very, very important. And I, from everything I've read about Robert Smalls, he was a, a very, very um, intelligent and charismatic um, human being. He later ended up uh, being the pilot of the planter um, for the Union. Um, they never gave him a commission as a captain or as a pilot. And this this became litigated many, many years afterwards. Um, he eventually did get, he di eventually did retire um, on $30 a year as a um, Union uh, naval captain. Um, but it took a long time going. And I think it's really important to also note about what was going on in this country right after the Civil War. Uh, Robert Smalls was able to, um, to become educated, um, to grow. Um, they set up a wonderful, he and a bunch of um, um, other entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs, um, set up a, a horse-drawn rail line that ran from the harbor to Charleston, about 11, 13 miles. And they could move goods back and forth along this little rail line with horses and, 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 um, and donkeys pulling it. So there's a, there's a, you know, this was the beginning of, okay, the freedom of everybody, having 
all the rest and 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 the 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 chains were taken away but slowly slowly um as reconstruction was going on the political environment the the confederacy reared its ugly head again and they worked to set up the whole jim crow thing if you could have stopped and allowed the reconstruction to continue at this time this country would be vastly different and it would have a totally different attitude towards immigrants um, towards the african-american population white people would have uh, gone through a point of acceptance and realizing that their arrogance was uncalled for um, and not accepted, and the country would have a different sense of itself and a different sense of um, its bravado. So eventually, Robert Smalls became a congressman, and he was a congressman for many years, um, he was an inspiration. He was uh, a publisher. His house is in Charleston. It's a historic landmark. In fact, the house that he and his mother were slaves in, he bought. And the kind of man that he was, he allowed the slave owner's wife to spend the rest of her days in that house after he had bought the house. It's in Charleston, right in downtown. Very interesting. It's just the emotional context of all of this is just amazing. But let's get back to the idea of the American pilot. The American pilot required a great deal of skill. Um, if any of you have ever needed a pilot or had met a pilot or had gone into a place, I think about going into um, uh, La Rochelle, um, very complicated uh, harbor to get into in France, La Rochelle in France. Um, and I think about the islands out there and, and all the shoals and looking at charts and to look at the whole thing. Uh, I think about going up the Bordeaux River, the river in Bordeaux, um, uh, Biron. And I'm thinking about these little places in the world. I'm thinking about uh, the Panama Canal going through the Panama Canal or just simply uh, going down through the Suez Canal. There are other places in which you have to zigzag in order to get into the port from different sets of sandbars, go across one and then go across another and have different places. I'm thinking about in the South Pacific, going across um, a lot of the atolls to get close to an island that just surrounded by reef and, you know, large breaking waves. I think about all of that kind of stuff and how those local pilots really do make um, a difference. And they really do make a, um, they, they help with your safety. And I give them a lot of credit for doing what they do because, you know, being an American pilot is a difficult job. They get paid extremely well. Um, don't, don't get me wrong. They, they do make some, some buck, but they're on call. They work 24 seven, you know, they have their shifts, of course, just like anybody else. But if I've been out on boats and on ships and watch these guys work and, um, this, it, you're paying for knowledge, you're paying for safety and that's what they bring you. So the American pilot, I think is a special breed. And I think the history of the American pilot, the evolution of the American pilot, is really a much larger story about the evolution of America itself. I could actually go back and, and uh, talk about the Revolutionary War. Um, during the Revolutionary War in 1776, 1778, there were very few white American pilots. And in fact... Um, um, all along the Chesapeake and all along the, uh, the Delaware Rivers and Cape May and those areas, they were all black Bermudan pilots. And that goes back to the development of the, the sloop, the Bermudan sloop. And they, they designed and they sailed these ships. They modified uh, 
they modified a ship, they modified a boat with a, a different kind of sail plan, the triangular sail plan with a Genoa or jib out front that allowed them to point to the wind and control the boat with a much better feel. Whereas uh, the larger ships were, were designed to um, ha- be very deep and have um, square sails, and their going to the wind was extremely poor, a lot of leeway. So a lot of set and drift calculations, a lot of uh, understanding the change in winds, um, especially on the East Coast. Um, you have a lot of, uh, shifting of onshore, offshore. One sometimes is stronger than the other. The other is stronger. It depends on the season. Um, you know, in the summer you can get some strong, um, onshore winds. Um, and then in the winter you get some strong offshore winds and it can go, it can be reversed. It just depends on how the weather systems are moving through. And to have a pilot who's responsible for these ships, Um, understand these things without weather reports, without navigation aids, I think is really quite remarkable because the goods that they were safeguarding were incredibly valuable. And they became very, very valuable people. But even though they were valuable people, they were never given the due credit. They were never allowed to not be slaves. There are some stories that I'm going to tell later about the Revolutionary War about some of the bravest men fighting, hand-to-hand combat, boarding ships, firing cannons, all the rest, and captaining these ships and winning, yet they were still slaves and they had to go back to the plantation. You think about that. I want to thank you for listening. Um, My name is Scott Dodgson. Uh, you can find uh, my books under my author page on Amazon.com, Scott Dodgson. You can also find all the previous podcasts. This is number 76, so there's quite a few to listen to. I hope you listen to them. You can find that on offshoreexplorer.org. I'm also having page Scott-Dodgson, which is going to be my home author page because I'm mixing not only the sailing, um, I'm mixing uh, a few other um, television shows that we're working on and a number of other things. And um, proves to be very, very excited. I know there's a lot of... Uh, uh, we've had a lot of people listening to us, and so... If you've uh, stuck around this long and listened to me, um, I appreciate it. We thank you. Um, And I would ask you to uh, please uh, leave a comment. Uh, If you're listening to me on Apple, it's pretty easy to do. Um, You could leave a comment on on offshoreexplorer.org. There's a a place that you could send a a message to me directly. Um, Kind of cool. But um, I just uh, ask you to take a listen, take a look at the book. I appreciate it. And um, we will um, get back with you uh, right after Thanksgiving. Um, I am working on a special treat and um, thought we'd kind of dip back into uh, actually sailing and what it takes to, you know, start sailing and, you know, Standing there, you know, looking at all the boats in the harbor and thinking to yourself, yeah, I want to get on one of those and I want to talk about the process of doing that. And I've got some people that uh, I'd love for you to meet and um, we'll kind of get kicked back into that a little bit right after uh, Thanksgiving. Anyway, many, many thanks. Um, Please like, uh, please refer, put some stars out there. Appreciate it. And I hope you, uh, you liked it, and I wish you uh, uh, fair winds and smooth seas. This is Scott Dobson, Offshore Explorer.